What's podcast alongside Joe Gilio. I'm Joe Obias. Uh, as I said in the cold open on the podcast version, Joe, I'm not going to go full like semi-sonic here, but it is closing time for the Carolina Hurricanes and the New Jersey Devils. Let's see if they can make this happen at PNC Arena tonight. I think you and I are on the same page with this. I think the Canes are a better team than New Jersey. I think they have the ability to take care of their business tonight at PNC Arena. However, historically, mm. this has not been a spot where the Canes show up and take care of business. Uh, Do I have to pull up the before. yellow pads? You might. You here, I did something wrong here. That's uh, I, I'm no, I'm. I'm look, I'm learning out. this. No, I didn't I kick. You I, I, I accidentally kicked you out. Yes, I accidentally kicked because I was yeah. trying to pull up the yellow pad. So I'm going to have to do it the other way uh, through Twitter because I thought I was able to pull up this uh, thing. See, folks, this is what you get when you start hanging out with us as we're trying to understand everything in the world of of uh, of YouTube and, and doing all these things live to tape if you will. So anyway, you would put the yellow pad stats together uh, for what's going on with game five tonight. You're saying it's not necessarily a given for this team, eh? Yeah. Historically, this has not been a spot where they close teams out. However, you'll note once you see the yellow pad, the one team that they did close out was the New Jersey Devils back in 06, also in the second round. We've talked a lot about second round energy and how these things can kind of go more quickly than the first round and even the conference finals. Uh, I think you'll see the Canes, after just an outstanding effort in in game four, I think you'll see them be on their game tonight. And and barring some sort of use brothers bonanza, I I think the Canes take care of business tonight. Well, you bring up the the Hughes brothers bonanza. That, that, That seems to be an overall trend with this version of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Scoring is up relative to shots on goal and some of it might have to do with what we talked about yesterday and what i was adamant about on monday after the hurricanes were quote unquote embarrassed in their loss in game three with that 8-4 final i'll repeat myself and i guess that's the beauty of podcasts when i said it on the radio it just kind of goes into the ether and i have to remind you that i say these things now you can just go back yeah joe you already said this in episode three time okay, stamp so it you, <laughs> i know i got to time stamp it right so you can just go right to it point being that um netminders in this round of the playoffs are okay and this gets back to something that you get you bang on me about rod brindamore just simply asking for a goalie whether it's freddie anderson whether it's auntie ranta whether it's peter kachekov to give them a chance and then they can do the rest. And that's really been the MO of this playoffs for everybody. I mean, you there's been an, a, a crazy amount of blowouts to the point where even the broadcasters, as Defector pointed out, I noticed this too, broadcasters both, both on Turner and on ESPN are like, hey, 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 anything can happen, y'all. Stick around. That's been a thing. Hockey has changed so much. You know, let's be uh, let, let's keep going behind the scenes here a little bit. When you were on with Adam, right? Yeah. My primary time to listen to you in the lost years of the Canes was in at Carpool. Oh, and I would, would I would text you. you I would text, text you. I'd be like, I'd be like, Joe, they're terrible. Why are you talking about them? Right? Love so love I went, we talk hey, to Forslin every game day. We're like, we talk oh, to Forslin every game right. day. And you're like, I love Forslin, but they're terrible. But, right. But here's the thing. I went on probably like a five, six year break where I didn't go mm-hmm. to a hockey game. OK, yeah. so I came back probably one of the last years of Peters and I'm looking at the team. I'm watching. I went to a game. I sat in a, in a uh, the NNO, the old NNO suite. And mm-hmm. I sat there and I'm like, the game, the NHL has changed so much in the last just 15 years. And you think back to those, you know, the, the cockamamie hits from Scott Stevens. It, you know, at the time, you know why I went back? Because of Skinner. I went back to watch Skinner. He was sure. having the concussion issues. Sidney Crosby was having concussion issues. And the NHL said, kind of like the NFL, we can't have this anymore. This mm-hmm. isn't what our game is about. And the game went from, and we really started to see this in 06, even when the Canes came back from the uh, the lockout speed. 
and they made rule changes. They really changed the game. And all you got to do is look at somebody, you know, like an Ajo, a Kokanyemi, a Natchez, that they would not have lasted, you know, in those series with the Devils 20, 22 years ago. Wouldn't have been a thing. And, and now they're in a position where they can dominate. Smaller players can dominate. Yeah. And you saw this last year with Colorado. Speed can dominate. And, and the Canes have that formula. The question is, do they have the tippy-top talent like in Edmonton? like Colorado last year well, to really close this thing out. This is where this is where we get back to your insistence on bracket luck. Bracket luck being mm-hmm. very real. And we might address a hey Joe question that ties into uh, our conversation with Greg Wyshynski from ESPN on Monday where you said there's big Virginia basketball energy with uh with the Carolina Hurricanes to a certain extent. I think it's a little bit more exciting watching the hockey version of it that you, you're going to have breaks in the bracket leading up to the Stanley Cup playoffs. So stay with me here. Again, I was reading Defector this morning, and they were pointing out all the instances in which things have been uh, crazy blowouts, right? So Laura Thiessen, uh, Lauren Thiessen uh, jotted this down. Of the, basically, 3.18 goals per game averaged by each team this season was the highest since 93-94. Basically, although I think you put up more goals in NHL 94 on the Sega Genesis. Shots are up a little bit, but not to the same rate, leading to a save percentage of 0.904. That's the lowest since the post-lockout year of 0506, which you mentioned. There was that was by design, by the way. Yeah. Because part of that lockout and part of the rules, and we'll talk to Eric Cole about this in a little bit. Part of all those rules changes was to modernize and make the game more exciting. And the Canes absolutely took advantage of that throughout the regular season. They ran the table. But here's the stat that gets back to the bracket luck, right? The big bad monsters are no longer out there for the Carolina Hurricanes. Of the top 10 goalies by save percentage this year, again, from Defector, only two, that would be Jake Odinger and Ilya Samsonov, are tied for sixth while still competing for the Cup. That's it. That's all that's left. You're seeing this with the New Jersey Devils where their goaltending situation is shaky. It's not that the Canes are any better, by the way, because you can see how quickly it can get away from them. We saw this on Sunday uh, for Freddie Anderson. Well, and but, but my, my, my point is that next up, let's say, I think it's going to be the Florida Panthers. I mean, credit to the Toronto Maple Leafs for finally, like, you know, gutting winning one a out. Series. Winning, they won a series. Now they had to win a game in the next series, which they did down in Florida. Um, but I still, Florida is still going to come away with that. But if you watch, if you watch the Panthers play, they got some top end. But after that, you, yeah, you, the Panthers do not want to run with the Hurricanes, as you've been mentioning. Well, they will try the though. Will Williams thing. They'll try, but they can't, yeah. and that's another good matchup for the Carolina Hurricanes to get to the Stanley Cup Finals. Yeah, think of it this way, Joe. When you when you talk about goalies, right? Who who were the two teams in the East that you would sit here and say, well, they're going to try to win the Cup primarily with their goalie? Tampa, mm-hmm. obviously, they've done it, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> You don't need to guess with Vasilevsky. He, you know, he is no. the best. I know the numbers were a little bit down this year, but still, Gary Williams' right, death right, rule. Right, right. We're taking Vasilevsky, right? Right. I, I think right. the Rangers in the last two or three years have looked at Vasilevsky and said, "Okay, in Shesterkin, we've got one of those guys." Mm-hmm. Didn't happen, and, and quite frankly, the Devils got to him and they cooked him. So, you know, there, as you like to say, there's a lot of voodoo with goaltending in the NHL. There is. There is a lot of voodoo. One other thing to keep in mind for tonight, uh, we didn't talk about this yesterday, but uh, I'm expecting the Carolina Hurricanes to wrap this thing up. So I'll be curious to see how uh, the national networks discuss it. So here's our governor, Roy Cooper. He's very prolific on Twitter, as you know, Joe. A huge, huge, huge caniac, as we also know. But he pointed out, look, look, one bad game doth not make a series. But he added one more thing. ESPN announcers are extraordinarily biased against our Canes, griping about calls, extolling the talented Jersey and grudgingly acknowledging that quote, Carolina deserves credit. Seriously, dudes. I can hear Roy Cooper say the seriously dudes. Cause he said it to you when you handed him some stuff earlier this yeah. year. Here's my, thing. yeah, I, I'm, I'm slightly disappointed in the gov there, but, <laughs> But and again, my neighbor the Swede was like, "You gotta let, you gotta have me on. I gotta defend myself." <laughs> like, it's all right, look, man. Like, I get look. it. You're you're a fan, and, and I'm just trying to tell you 
that's not how this all plays out. But I mean, it is hard to defend ESPN when they're when they're when PK Subin is up there, just dead in his feels. Oh, just absolutely in his feelings. And and this is what I was getting at. Let's get over the we deserve credit. We demand to be taken seriously, folks. The Carolina Hurricanes are never going to be taken seriously, period, for a variety of reasons. Market has something to do with it. Southern hockey has another thing to do with it. People can respect Rod Brindamore, but they're not necessarily going to respect the Canes overall. It's fine. It is what it is. There was an online. You get respect, though, Joe. They didn't get respect in 06. Sure, they did. They didn't get respect. I mean, it didn't help. In 06. Yeah, it didn't help after they won it, right? Yeah. The next year, they kind of flamed apart. That, that was yeah. They had the they had the hangover. They had the hangover, and they went through well, the wilderness yeah, I think again. People in '06, you, you're misremembering. I think '06, not in a bad way. Just Rod, Glenn Wesley, those were two yeah. guys well respected across the league. And when they had their chance to put their name on that cup, uh, mm. I, I think people understood. That. Also, I think Peter Laviolette was a coach at the time. Remember, he was with the Islanders. He was in the Bruins system. He was kind of like an up-and-comer. And I think people respected him as well. I think maybe in in as the years have gone on, Jim Rutherford mm-hmm. has earned more respect. Because remember, uh, that was his after first they time left. On the after, after they after. left the organization. Yes. Again, after they yes, left. I think Peter Carl. And, Peter and Mo, Carl- too. Was- Peter, Car- yeah, Paul Maurice went from oh man, he's only like worthy for the Canes to being a very well respected, viewed as one yeah. of the smartest minds in the NHL. Again, it gets back to the overall point of they left the Canes. My thing is is really simple. You know, when we talk about the Carolina Hurricanes, there is a there's a there's features and bugs. The way that we have kind of been a college market for so long and we treat the Carolina Hurricanes as like the one unifying thing that all area yeah. fans can get behind and then the college mentality extends itself to things like tailgating and whatnot you got to remember that if you're a Carolina fan Tar Heel fan you're used to being talked about all the time um state has a little bit of that sandpaper to them because they're discussed in a negative way so my point is that the college mentality takes over for the Hurricanes as well. There was an online survey from earlier this season that pointed out that Carolina Hurricanes fans are probably the most obnoxious fans on the internet because they're constantly looking and demanding respect. And I think that folks see that and they play into it. And I'll use this analogy again. It's really not all that different from Jeff Goodman poking the bear with with NC State sure. fans, right? Or when a national media person wants to poke the bear and bring up Russell Wilson. It's they they know they're going to get the cheap pop, and Hurricanes fans are more than happy to give them that cheap pop. But what I'm saying is, you know, I'm not saying to not engage. I'm simply saying embrace it. Embrace the fact that the Carolina Hurricanes continue to be a spoiler, and you should take joy out of the fact that after the Canes win this series, you can turn on a studio show and people are going to be in their feelings. That should like look as maybe as somebody who's fueled by petty, a lot of things guide me through pettiness. I feel like the Hurricanes fans should embrace the fact that they get discussed this way and then get great joy watching P.K. Subban. Well, as I drop my mic here, I have to, again, I got to like, you know, find proper mic placement, everything else. We need a studio space, Joe. We need a studio space in the worst way. Anyway, moving on. Next topic, please. <laughs> so, love ran. Before we get to the next topic. Uh, I thought I was an authority on, you know, mic placement and radio and everything else. Maybe I need to contact Mosquito Authority and Pest Authority to show me where to put my mic in the camera and everything else, Joe. I know they they were here earlier this week to do the mosquito treatment. Uh, they can do that for you throughout the summer. No contracts, by the way. So whenever you feel like you're done, you're good to go. That's why I'm a big fan of Mosquito Authority. Yeah, go to bugsbite.com, punch in your zip code. You're going to get the information that you need to hook up with your Mosquito Authority, Pest Authority. Check them out on Twitter. It's no mosquito NC, or you can call them. I think that's still a thing, Joe. Can you still? Call I think people? you still. I think you can still call. I think you can All still right. call. I think that's a thing that you can do. Yes. So 919-807-1951. 919-807-1951. Mosquito Authority, Pest Authority, ants, termites. Again, the moisture in your crawl space. If you're thinking about selling your home. I know this is the time of the year. Kids get out of school. You start thinking about the real estate market. You got to make sure your house is in the right shape to get the best price. Call Mosquito Authority, Pest Authority. Check out your place to make sure 
that your house is in great shape. So to NFL schedules, that's going to get released tonight. As of this recording, it's 8.50. Your favorite! It's my <laughs> favorite, favorite thing in the world. I absolutely love schedules. It's like, what's, what is it? The, um, what was, oh geez, what was the movie where the guy shows up with the, with the phone books? He's like, the, it, it, the jerk, the phone books are here. The phone books are, the schedule is here. Although I feel like the schedule release is no longer just one big event. It gets teased. There's spoilers. I get tweets from Adam Schefter. I see team reporters breaking out sources. Here's what's going on. The NFL itself is spoiling its own schedule release. And shout out to the Carolina Panthers who are actually having a schedule release party with live music and everything else from 7 to 9 tonight outside Bank of America Stadium. So the question is going to be, you know, how many primetime games are the Carolina Panthers going to get? You got to remember that these things all have a formula. We know who the who the who the Panthers are going to play. Did I say the Hurricanes? I know who the Panthers are going to play. They play the NFC North, they play the AFC South, and they have that AFC East game, which will be the Miami Dolphins. So the Panthers are going to be going to Florida three times this year. you got Tampa Bay in the division. You've got the Jaguars with the AFC South matchup, and then they're going to be playing the Miami Dolphins at some point this season. But with the overall number one pick in the draft, Joe, all eyes are going to be in how many primetime games can the Panthers show up on. And the interesting wrinkle this year, which is going to really piss off some folks, that Sunday to Thursday turnaround, which only used to happen once, is now happening twice because Roger Goodell's got to make TV partners happy. All right. Let's play the hits here, Joe. All the NFL <laughs> has to do is add a second open date to yeah. its schedule. There will be no short turnaround for any team and your Super and Bowl will be moved back one week, which scratches head, checks calendar, looks at notes. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's a national holiday the next day. And, yes, before you get start firing things off in the comment section, I realize not everyone has off on President's Day. Yeah. But you know who does. Your kids. And that's what's important. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to wake your ass up the next morning after a Super Bowl party. Hello, and drive your kids to school. So, so <laughs> NFL, pretty please, with sugar on top. Not for me. Not for me. Because let's be serious here for a second. This is about player safety. And I know yes. they claim they have data that the short turnaround does not affect injuries. I they say injuries are they say injuries are flat. Me. Yeah, I would love for you to explain to me how Tua Tonga Vailoa almost died on primetime television after getting a second concussion in a matter of four days. But no, I guess that's not part of the data. I guess we don't really care about that yeah. because, well, you know, Joe, he was just in the fencer's post and everybody was, you know, terrified on live television. But since he didn't die, well, whoo, okay, let's add some more short turnaround games because oh, that's man. really what we need. That's the that's the basis of every NFL decision at this point in time. It's kind of like a, it's like in The Hangover, right? Where Ken John's character is like, "But did you die? Oh, you didn't. Yeah. Cool. We can we can oh, just go cool. ahead and move things on, right? I mean, the same, same thing happened with Demar Hamlin. We're not looking at <laughs> the measures in which Demar Hamlin ultimately got saved. It was really about can we continue playing or not? I mean, we're that he's alive is amazing, um, and really a I'm testament to the first responders that he's come back. But like, yeah. let's not make that like, oh, so we're all good. But we're all, it's okay. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go and take I'm gonna take the NFL's word when it comes to injuries that essentially they're flat uh, Sunday to Thursday. But this kind of ties back to something Mark Cuban, Dallas Mavericks owner, talked about years ago, where he talked about pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered, et cetera, et cetera, and that the NFL is gonna get too greedy, and that's what this schedule really is about. I, I'll be honest, like for the first time in a long time, I'm legitimately interested in the logistics of the NFL schedule, not from the I got to plan my fall and winter. It's more along the lines of how does the NFL maximize its dollar value? Because that's their number one goal to maximize their money in an era where everything is being re retracted, OK, where you're seeing regional networks file for bankruptcy, where you're seeing ESPN numbers drop over time. But there's still one thing on the market that can guarantee live eyeballs, and that's the NFL, and they're trying to maximize it the best way they can. But they also have to make their partners happy, 
which is why you're seeing these Sunday, Thursday turnarounds and more marquee matchups on a Thursday night because Amazon paid a hell of a lot of money to broadcast those games exclusively. You also have NBC, CBS, and Fox paying a lot of money. Interesting wrinkle for the season. They're not going to have the traditional CBS, AFC, Fox, NFC, and of course, you know, Sunday Night Football, Sunday Night Football, Monday Night Footballs, Monday Night Football. While Mike Mulvihill, who uh, works for Fox, pointed out there are still a minimum requirement for appearances, you are not going to traditionally see your typical NFC and AFC matchups on your respective networks this upcoming season. Again, that is to make the networks happy in the long run. The one thing these Thursday night, Sunday night things do is that it does affect the competitive balance. Fine. I'm going to grant you injuries. Cool. However, you can't sit here and tell me that a team that played Sunday and has to turn around and play on Thursday isn't a competitive disadvantage, and that's going to matter in what do we know about the NFL, man? It's the first three, four weeks in the season, and people are already freaking out about playoff implications. And now you're adding that wrinkle to parity, and good teams are going to find themselves up against it because of this turnaround because the teams that are good, the teams that people want to see, are going to be the ones that have to deal with this Sunday, Thursday turnaround more than the bad teams. Yeah, the biggest one to me, Joe, the biggest thing that stood out of all the things that have been leaked, the NFL, to the Mark Cuban point, creeping yeah. into that Friday game. The yes. Black Friday game yes. in November, yes. I believe, will be the first Friday regular season NFL mm -hmm. game in however – that's not a Christmas or a Christmas Eve in however long. And you yeah. know that's just a trial balloon to see if they can get into that night. Are you – I, I want to get back to the the leaking or not the leak the leaking of the schedules. Are you a spoiler guy? Like, do you get caught up not, in trying to stay spoiler free? I do not like spoilers. I'm the worst when it comes to this, though. Mm -hmm. Let's use uh, Game of Thrones as a, as an example. The last show right. that I really, 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 really cared about. Okay? Sure, 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 sure. I was the one who would download like the bootleg episodes <laughs> off of like the streaming service that the one where the the dragon got killed were you on pirate bay man you, like download yeah like torch? that when the dragon got killed <laughs> up, up, up beyond the wall i saw yeah, that yeah, episode yeah, yeah. like five weeks before it came out oh wait when the drag uh, when the dragon got got by the big giant arrow that's the one yeah i oh, saw okay, that one yeah. like five weeks before it came out like the but i'm also i go the opposite way like i still have not seen the end of better call saul yeah, yeah, spoiler. He, he becomes a lawyer for a drug dealer. I got it. It's a prequel. Well, that's a, well, it's a prequel. But, but I haven't seen that yeah. whole last season. Right? I see. Okay, gotcha. So I don't want to read anything about it. I don't want to know it. And I, and I realize how far behind I am. But when it comes out on Netflix, I will watch the whole season. And okay. then I'll be on my merry way. I, gotcha. You and I were both spoiled, un unfortunately, by our friend Bonnie Jones. With the succession. Oh, succession. Right. The, the movie well, okay. So, all right. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up. I I don't I am not necessarily bothered by spoilers because well, for a variety of reasons uh, when it comes to complicated shows like Game of Thrones sometimes I actually found it helpful to read a recap ahead of watching an episode so I had a better idea of what was going on like the AV Before? Club back oh yeah like AV Club and uh, uh, what is it uh, I, I think it's uh, Jason Concepcion for The Ringer. Yeah. They would do Gosh, like, you know, the, the maesters, whatever, right? And because they read the books, they had a better understanding of contextualizing what they were condensing into an hour. So I actually had a greater appreciation for what was unfolding by reading the recaps. And I had a better like, okay, I, I can connect these dots a little bit more rather than being confused. I'm like, wait, who is that person again? Why are they mad at that person? What's Littlefinger doing here? Chaos is a ladder, right? It's like all these things. The... So like the succession part too, like finding out that Logan Roy dies, that didn't necessarily bother me either because I'm watching I'm watching succession for the acting, okay? Like the characters on that show are acting their ass off, man. That's why oh. I watch. That's why I watch the show. So and and they get into corporate legalese that I can't keep up with. So if I read a spoiler, I have a better understanding of like why this person's angling against this person or anything else. But 
what I think is hilarious are the schedule truthers or like there's a new Zelda game coming out tomorrow and people want to go in completely cold and then get mad at other people for doing reviews or discussing it or whatever. Like if you truly want to go into something cold, I can't help you. You right. have to just log you the hell you. off. You got to yeah. log off. You go outside yep. and you touch grass because we're out here discussing on the internet. We can't protect you. And I think the same thing's going on with the internet. Move on. Okay, fine. We'll move on. Eric Cole, Kane's legend. Best beard in the game joining us now. Whoa. Look at that beard. Nah, That's it's, good. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Eric Cole. Playoff. It's playoff time. It's always playoff time for you. What are you talking about? I saw you like at a Duke basketball game. You had the bull, the beard in full effect, man. Uh, yeah, that's that's to protect this uh, the, the money maker when I had. <laughs> All right, question, question though. I, I think we've discussed this. I can't remember. Is Rod Brindamore capable of growing a playoff beard, or is he just opt out? He is not. Okay, I just wanted to double check on that one. All right, man. So game five tonight. Um, th this Canes jersey series is a little bit different than the Canes jersey series that you were used to back in <laughs> 02, 06, or 09 when you came back. So what do you what have, what have you seen so far? What's impressed you about the Canes? Well, I think obviously, you know, the the penalty kill's been great, and the power plays continued to to do well. Um, that's been a, a, a real big you know, asset for, for the team uh, throughout the first two rounds, really. So I think everyone expected it to be kind of a, a fast pace up and down. Uh, Jersey likes to, put, likes to play a fast game as well. Um, so I, I, I think it's kind of lived up to what everyone expected it to be. I think that, the you know, both games being lopsided victories uh, in New Jersey was maybe a little surprising. Um, but I think that, you know, Carolina just, you know, we gave up an, an early goal mm -hmm. uh, again, but, you know, and they, they, but they were able to weather the rest of that first 10 minute storm. Like anytime you're going on the road, that's always what you talk about. You gotta, you gotta weather that first 10 minute storm where the crowd's into it and, you know, the other teams just feeding off of their energy and the atmosphere and you almost want to try and slow that game down a little bit and take the crowd out of it. And I think, you know, Carolina eventually got there. And then obviously with uh, with Marty's goal uh, late there, that really settled them in. And then, you know, what a, what a great second period that they had. Like they were hard on the forecheck and, yes. and creating creating turnovers. And that's – like that's their game. If and when they're doing that, they're a very, very tough team to play against. Eric, I know the guys that were the leaders on your team: Glenn Wesley, Rod Brendamore, Ron Francis. And I remember, I, if I heard it once, I heard it nine million times. You can't get too high, you can't get too low. You know, you got to stay on the even keel. You got to pay attention to today. Focus on this game. Focus on this shift. Yes, I got that part. Yes. However, <laughs> as a player. Did you ever allow yourself to look at the rest of the bracket, to look at the rest of everything else that was going on and maybe think to yourself, you know what? We can win this thing. Yeah, you know what? There's – I think there's only been kind of two times in the in the playoffs where, you, where I let my mind wander a little bit. One time was um, – Actually, Paul Maurice pointed it out to our group um, in that first round series against the Devils, and he was—he basically told us he's like, "Pay attention to what's going on." He's like, "Because you know the number one seed and the number two seed are about to get knocked out," mm -hmm. and he's like, "Like this is this is our this is our chance. This is our moment. Like we need to take advantage of it." and you know, we were able to close out New Jersey and now all of a sudden we're, you know, the top team in the East. Um, so that was maybe one instance. And the only other time I let myself wander like that was after we won game one in Detroit that same season. Ooh. Ooh. Uh -oh. Ooh. <laughs> no more wandering. Oh, <laughs> <I'll never. laughs> we were sitting on the bus. It was the bus ride back to the hotel. And I was like, 
man, we're three away from this thing. <laughs> I was like, I was like, wow. Yeah. Like, wow. You were like, there's like, a K in Cole. Like, Eric I'm Cole like, with a K. We're, <laughs> like, we're, we're in one. <laughs> and, oh, man. Was, well, was the, that was the last time I ever. <laughs> Smart, man. Smart man. Hey, you bring up Paul Maurice. You played for Mo. And, and Joe and I were just talking before about it kind of took him to leave North Carolina to get the respect that, that he has been deserved and all of the different stops that he's had and, and the success he's having right now with the Panthers. I know. How, how do you look at the Panthers right now and how do you see how they've he's changed or perhaps some of his style has changed? And I know, I know he was not uh, warm and cuddly, even though he was a young guy coaching and he was also a guy who was unbelievable with the media. I know it was a little bit different as a player. Well, I think, with Mo, I, I always enjoyed him because you always knew where you stood with him. And he was always very, very direct with where he felt your game was at. And then when it came to, you know, the motivating and, and like the, the X's and O's, he, he was very, very good at that as well. So for me, I really enjoyed playing for Paul. I am not surprised one bit that he's gone on to have successful coaching stints with other organizations. And certainly not surprised at all. I think actually a former teammate um, from that 09 team when Boston went down in game seven and somebody texted me was like, Mo, you know, Mo's seen that, seen that one before, you know, hmm. referencing Scotty Walker goal. So, you know, I don't, I'm not surprised whatsoever. Um, I know that, you know, they, they're a team that, they went through some adversity, you know, this season and yeah. they had some turnover in the off season. So, you know, to see them, you know, you also, you feel like a world beater when you, you knock off the number one seed. So it's not no surprise that they, you know, walk into Toronto and, and take two there right away. Then, you know, win game three at home. Obviously their last game was a little bit, you know, shaky. I'll say, yeah. um, but I mean, you got to expect pushback. Like you know, those guys get paid too, so they they all <laughs> want to win. That was Eric the whole Cole. Fiction game. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Eric Eric Cole hanging out with us here. Not Obius surprised. And, and Julio. Actually, one thing. And again, Joe Joe and I were talking about. Right now, fans are understandably annoyed by the national coverage. Now that everything's shifted to national coverage on ESPN and Turner. It's fine. It's whatever. I, I don't get too wrapped up in it, but I understand where fans are coming from. Do you give a crap about any of that stuff? Because if I remember correctly, 05, 06, what you guys are coming out of the lockout, rules changes. You clearly took advantage of it. Um, but there was always a dismissive of, there was always this dismissive like, eh, wait till the playoffs or eh, it's Carolina. You know, they, they have no experience. Once they get to the playoffs, things will get tight. Um, somebody will take care of it. So did you pay attention to any of those types of things about respect or did it fuel you at all? I think, uh, I think honestly, like it was more in like the preseason and then even throughout the year it was a little, like a little insulting at times. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 we just used that as motivation in, in the locker room. You know, I think even just for me personally, um, throughout my playing career, like, tell me I can't do something and right. chances are I'm going to prove you wrong. So yeah. it's, um, you know, for, for me, that was always just, you know, it was, it was another log on the fire for me. And I think especially in that 05, 06 year where we felt like we had a really, really good team. We were coming in with the new rules and everyone was trying to, you know, navigate that a bit, but, it opened up so much ice, you know, mm -hmm. especially for me personally, but for a lot of our, a lot of our players and for our up-tempo, you know, North South game that we wanted to play. Like we wanted to, you know, get the puck into the offensive zone as fast as we could and just start rattling around and hold on to the puck and, you know, spread the zone, use, use the entire offensive zone. And, yeah, we certainly took full advantage of it. I mean, if you remember that year, I mean, we were coming out of the lockout and we didn't we were like really. Twenty-one. Weren't you like twenty-one points clear of Tampa in that in that year? What's that? 
Weren't you like 21 points or 20 some odd points clear of Tampa in the division with how you guys just ran the table? I think yeah, it something it, we, like that. It yeah, it got locked up early, like almost too early. But right. Because then, you know, all of a sudden you're not playing some of those meaningful games. Like <laughs> right. But um but no, it was I think in in that season when we when we completed that first nine game win streak, that was when I think all of us in the room were like, Yeah, we're we're doing this. Like this is like we're for real. And now we're just gonna keep going and we we had a pretty good December, but then we had the best you know, at, at that time, like the best month in franchise history in January, we added Doug Waite, and it was like, yeah, like we're, we're, you know, we're cup contenders now. Like, and, and I don't think that a lot of people outside the room believed it yet at that point. But I think mm-hmm. when, you know, when your general manager goes out and adds a player of that caliber and of that respect level from, from his peers, it's, it says something and it's, it's a boost of confidence, you know, for every player on the roster. About that to oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say real quick on that Joe. Sorry, because this is a conversation Julio and I had with Tom Dundon uh, back at the outdoor game when, you know, Canes had cap space approaching the trade deadline. And I kept going back to Oh six, like, look, you signal to the room. Like you said, we're in, so we're going to go add. Canes didn't really do that. Now, Ghost of Spare has been a, an unbelievable addition for uh, the Canes so far. But I guess there's another way to signal to the room. Hey, we like this group. It's a veteran group. We think we can do that if everybody knows their roles and steps ups and everything else. And I guess we're kind of seeing that, you know, whether it's Natchez kind of continuing his season or even a guy like Martin Oak, who's getting rewarded in this series for all the stuff that he does. Yeah, I think in, in that instance, it... I mean, it's not like trades weren't like attempted or you know try, tried. To make, sure, like, sure, you know, sure. Where you know Patch is going to be coming back into the lineup, so you're you know you're excited about adding him, but then you know, all of a sudden you lose both he and Svetch, and then it's like oh man, like. But at the same time, like you don't want to ever like jeopardize you know, the, the, the future and the, the foundation that we have now in terms of the organizational depth, like, you know, the like Carolina's organizational depth right now is probably close to as, as good as it's ever been. And you want to protect that and being able to continue on the path where, you know, you're each year with a lot of these younger players that have been here, you're expecting them to take the next step and you're expecting them to progress and get to that level that your scouting staff, you know, always thought this is the player that they should become. And you have to allow them, you know, that, that space and that time to mature. And I think that that's also another way of looking at it. I put together a yellow pad chart today of game five opportunities for the Carolina hurricanes to close out series you, you just happen to play in four of those games. Uh, is it human nature to to think, oh, well, we're coming home. We're going to win. We'll just roll out the puck and lace up the skates and, and close this thing out? Or, or mm-hmm. what is the mindset there that you kind of have to fight against as a player? I think it's it's being able to to play with a little bit of that, like, controlled, controlled, like, it, aggression basically controlled and enthusiasm yeah you almost have to dial back a little bit of like your like adrenaline and your your emotion that you're going to be like feeding off of off of the crowd um i mean when you know this time of year especially you're, you're pulling into the parking lot and there's already a bunch of fans out there tailgating and you know then the atmosphere inside the arena you know, prior to coming out for the national anthem, like you feel it, you, you see it, it's, I mean, it's there. So I think that, you know, Carolina has to take full advantage of being on home ice, take full advantage of the enthusiasm from our great fans. And you almost, 
I think the way we word it a lot of times in the locker room is you, you try and break their will. You want, you want to put the doubt in their mind or you want to make them feel like, man, you know what, this is just, you know, too, too high a mountain to climb. And we are, or it's just, or it's, you know, it's not our year It's kind of, you know, like, I mean, you're trying to end a team season, so it's yeah. always the toughest game to win. And I think that, I think that if you just, just mentally kind of take it one shift at a time, win your battles, have your compete level as high as possible, just focus on your one-on-ones. Like I always just used to, I, you know, you, you pick a guy on the other side and you're like, I'm not going to let him beat me. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's every little battle. It was, you know, for me, like, especially in the years I played with Roddy where, you know, you know, face-offs aren't always won by the centerman. <laughs> and he's like, you know, I, you, you learn really early playing with him where it's like, he's like, Hey, that puck sits there. That's your puck. <laughs> he's like, <"Kill> it. <laughs> I was like, okay. well, that's for my percentage. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> You screwed me. Uh, yeah. Stop it. Yeah, he's like, he's like, I, I won that draw, like right there for you to tap it back. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you messed up. So, you know, it's it's just focusing on on the little things and the details. And if you do that, you should be fine. You mentioned ending someone's season. Was there and, and the one of the great traditions in sports is that the handshake after the the series ends. Was there ever a series where you did not want to shake someone's hand? <laughs> yeah. Um, 09 conference final. Mm. I'm sure you guys know. Yeah, Buffalo. Was it Aaron Ward? No. 09. Oh, oh no. 09 was well, – I'm getting my years confused. Oh, what happened Pittsburgh. in 09? Was it Pittsburgh? What, was, it, yeah. uh, was it Jordan Stahl? Because you guys got swept. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, we – we, I mean, after two, two seven game series, I think, yeah, we kind of, yeah, the, the, the tank was running a little on, on E for us. Uh, like in that, wasn't the guy that broke your neck, was it? Oh, there we go. That was gonna no, say, no, wait him, a minute, right? wait a minute, was it Orpic? Orpic Somebody broke was your on, neck? Yeah, he was. Ah. Yeah, Orpic was on there. Yeah. Okay. okay, that would make sense. Uh, we haven't cursed this episode. If you'd like to throw one in there, we can. <laughs> it's a thing. No, all this, all this stuff runs together, man. It all runs together. <laughs> It's crazy. Eric, we appreciate the time, man. Uh, always good catching up. Um, and we will talk to you later. Yep. Say when. All right, man. It's the OG. That is Eric Cole. We appreciate his time. Next topic, please. So the NBA rolls on, Joe. And let's see. Hold on a second. He's been. Re- okay. I had to make sure like Eric was no longer in the studio and whatnot. So. I'll, I'll text him later. Anyway, so uh, last night uh, I was watching a little bit of Toronto and Florida, and then I was slipping back and forth with some Heat culture and the Knicks. Uh, the Heat couldn't wrap that thing up. But I, it makes sense because the Heat were playing this game, Joe, in New York, so the weather was decent, right? Apparently the weather the weather in Miami Wait, is too much for the Knicks. Oh, you missed this. You missed this? All right. Yeah. So let me see if I can pull it up. Um, all right, because again, I'm still I'm still understanding the ins and outs of things. So this was Mike Greenberg from what was this Tuesday? Yes, Tuesday, May 9th. Here's what he had to say, particularly from Jalen, was how hard it is to go down to Miami and play this time of year. And I know people will immediately associate that with the nightlife and all that. But according to Jalen, there's more than that. There's also just the reality of the temperature change, the heat, the geography, being down there for three <laughs> days. It sort of saps a little bit of your energy and your strength. We talk about that primarily in football. I know this is an indoor sport, but I mean, the Knicks, <laughs> whatever it is, Jimmy Butler is just has has just destroyed them. <laughs> so anyway, going, that is. is going for uh, a hold on, a on the beach. What? Hold on, hold on. I have to like turn this thing off here. Oh, yeah, my bad. Anyway. Yeah, so uh, apparently uh, basketball indoor sport can still be, and where you practice indoors too, uh, can be negatively affected by the humidity uh, in South Florida. Although as people, including some of my family members pointed out, it's not like it was uh, abnormally warm in Florida this week. So I think the temperature chains might be, it's getting a little too hot at the King of Diamonds Club where you're having a good night out. That's where the heat's getting turned up and that sweat 
That sweat's not coming from the humidity. That sweat's coming from some other stuff you might have been doing in Miami. Come on now. Well, let's look at a real reason who's going to win this thing in the NBA because I, I think you're with me. And the difference between these teams, the teams that are left, is minimal. I think it's going to be obvious answer here, health. And you look at Anthony Davis get banged up last night. You know, the Lakers are on track to plow into the finals. You know, kind of like when the bracket goes to crap in the NCAA and UConn wins. Hey, if you can't find the obvious answer, the answer is LeBron James out West yeah. at least. Yeah. But, you know, the trick with LeBron this year is, and and has been at his with his tenure with the Lakers, how healthy is Anthony Davis? When he's healthy, they're really, really good. Look at you talked about Jimmy Butler and the Heat. When he can't play, obviously that's a problem for the Heat. So they need him to be healthy to carry them to a potential championship. And then you start looking at the Sixers. I know not a lot of people are talking about the Sixers because Boston has been the prohibitive favorite in the East all season long up until a Milwaukee hot streak. But then Milwaukee had injury problems with Giannis Antetokounmpo. So they're out. I think if Philly, if Embiid can stay on the floor and stay healthy, I, I think right now if you were to ask me what team do I think will win the championship, yeah, and if people stay healthy, I would say the 76ers. And I realize the handicap that Doc Rivers is, and I realize the handicap that James Harden, you know, being here one day and not there the next is. But mm -hmm. something there's something about the way that the Sixers are playing right now. And also, Joe, if they can take out the Celtics, the, the prohibitive favorite, that's another one of those things that Eric Cole, Eric Cole just talked about. When you get rid of that team, you get a little juice. You get a little jump from that. Yeah. And yeah. so I look at it, and that could be it could be disastrous for the Lakers last night. I know they've said, I know Darwin Ham said after the game that Anthony Davis was was doing okay, and and mm -hmm. obviously for someone who has a Lakers ticket, that's a hope for me. <laughs> uh, but they, it, they always, cannot, it always comes down to your ticket. Always comes down to your ticket. They cannot pull this thing off without Anthony Davis, just as the Heat can't without Butler, just as no. the Sixers can't without Embiid. Look, you know, it's funny you mentioned the Heat, and at the beginning of everything, uh, I was. You know, Tyler Hero goes out. He's done for the season, right? Done for the postseason. I was thinking to myself, ooh, yeah, you know what? Here's a team that didn't really have good perimeter shooting to begin with. Tyler Hero is your best option. What do we know with the NBA? Uh, but gotta the, 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 you got to shoot, but the <laughs> NBA also, you got to defend. And that, I think that's ultimately why the Heat have kind of, because that's, that's the other thing about Anthony Davis that's so important for the Lakers. You still got to defend. And as long as Jimmy Butler's on the court, the Heat are going to have a good opportunity to win these games. Plus, I don't think the I mean look, Knicks are at home, desperate team, trying to stave off elimination, everything else. Not surprised that happened. And again, most importantly, they were back in New York where the, the temperatures were cooler for Apparently. an indoor game. I guess They're NBA wrong. players, I guess NBA players are like my cats, right? Cats are they're in, they're indoor cats. No, hear me out. They're oh, indoor okay. cats. Okay? I don't know this. You know this. Lila and Pearl are indoor cats. They have no reason to be outside. It wasn't like R.I.P. Roy. Uh, my big majestic unit of a male cat who wanted to go outside and kill stuff. And when he had cancer, we let him outside and just live his best life, right? These are indoor cats. And yet, when it gets to warmer temperatures like right now, they're shedding. You're not outside. What do you care? You're in 75 degree temperatures all the time. And then when it gets to the winter, the winter coat comes out. Why? The heater's on. It's like 70 some odd degrees in here. What are you worried about? So I guess we're finding this out about NBA players. They're just like cats. They just kind of come and go as the temperatures are outside. One other NBA note, Mike Krzyzewski has a new job. I guess I guess he's bored in retirement. Uh, I guess he's done with his gardening projects. Uh, I saw this from Steve Wiseman over at the News and Observer. Kay now has a, an assist, like a, a special assistant to the general manager kind of role with the NBA. His first duties on this new job will be attending the NBA general managers meetings in Chicago next week. He will advise the league office and team executives on issues related to the game. You got to remember that Adam Silver, commissioner of the NBA, is a, what an 84 Duke grad. He was there for Coach K's final game at Cameron Indoor Stadium, sitting next to Jerry Seinfeld, of all people. I made sure to get that picture. But I'm just wondering what, what it is that Coach K is going to advise on, but hey, good for him. That leads us to a nice segue for some housekeeping notes here, Joe. You housekeeping. Steve Wiseman. Yeah, you, you know what? Steve Wiseman. We need Rand to, to give us a. We need Rand to give us a housekeeping. 
housekeeping, housekeeping jingle. That's what we need. That's what we yeah, need. Yeah, that's next. Uh, no, you mentioned Steve Wiseman, the News and Observer. You and I have, have made a deal. The OG Live Podcasting Company has made a deal with the News and Observer to share content and to be on their website and their and share our worldviews with them and do some stuff uh, with Luke Tacock and Steve Wiseman and Brooke Kane. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Ethan Hyman, uh, my my wonderful friend who I've missed all these I know. last few years. I spent my first 24 years of my journalism career at the News and Observer. So I'm really excited to uh, be working with them. I won't be writing, but I will be working with them. And I'm yeah. excited that we get to do that together. Yeah, I'm also looking forward to doing that. Uh, I've got some ideas uh, and you know, opportunity to be creative. And the thing I am most excited about, I'm happy for you. Uh, because I could never replace Ethan. Um, That's my guy. He's he's your road dog. I am not. And now you get you get your guy back. So I'm really happy that you you are now reunited. Ethan never left me at the airport gate, man. I'll just I'll just say that. I I do things a little differently, Joe. What's up next? What's up next? Let's get to some Hey Joe questions, shall we? You want to you want to answer a few Hey Joe questions? I do. Let's get two more housekeeping items, though. Oh, we have more don't housekeeping forget. items? Yeah. Don't forget, Wednesday, May 31st, we're going to be out at the UNC Health Championship. That's at the Raleigh Country Club this year. They're still looking for volunteers. So go to unchealthchampionship.com. That's their website. Look for the volunteers tab. Click on that. If you've never done that before, it's a great opportunity to get out, see the course, meet some of these players. It's a Corn Ferry Tour event. Used to be out at Wakefield. Now it's downtown. It's a great event. Uh, Empire Eats is going to be out there. There's going to be a Hurricanes Day out, day out there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so check them out, unchealthchampionship.com. And finally, yes, our contest to give away NFL Sunday ticket, still ongoing. Needs you to email the word football to the OG goes digital at gmail.com. That's football to the OG goes digital at gmail.com. Next week, we will pick three winners to play Jenga down at the Raleigh times to win our NFL Sunday ticket bonanza giveaway. Thank you to our friends at empire eats and the Raleigh times. All right. This is from Todd from the mountain. Hey Joe, why does national media insist on putting preseason expectations on UNC football? I guess there's some sort of like, I don't, I don't even, I, okay. There's a couple things that are going on here. All right. Let's look at the actual, like, what is this? JWP Sports CFB Alerts. I don't know what that is. Uh, hey this man, is almost like a... I'm not this in a position is to like, question the media in 2023. <laughs> so I'll just say, okay, hey, you know what? Made it to this guy's timeline. You know what? You're right. I have to get over myself. I'm no longer yeah. affiliated, affiliated with a legacy media company. Although, aren't we? Because we are going to be on the News and Observer. Uh, Regardless. We're there. Um, I think this is... This is where I pay my respects to Big Game Boomer. Okay, Big ga- Big Game Boomer changed the game with he how did. he went about his social media, where he'd put up these lists and people would get engaged with these lists. The schools would retweet these lists. He came up with like, "Here are your top fifty strength and conditioning coaches in college football." I'm like, how do you know this? Didn't matter for Big Game Boomer. He was putting that damn list together, and there and off he goes. So I think that he was a trailblazer, man. And now you got a lot of other websites that are trying to cut. Kind of basically copying or Twitter accounts that are copying what uh, big game boomer was doing. But look, the college football is not hard to understand when it comes to the preseason. There's too many football teams. So what do you do, Joe, when you were starting to look, when you were an AP college football, top 25 voter, what were the first, what was the first thing you looked at when it came to a football team? The first thing you looked at quarterback. What does North who's Carolina got, have? Who's got a good quarterback? And the, Carolina's got Drake May. I right. think then you look at the schedule, and then you look at the offensive line. Those are the three things that I would do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Carolina's schedule has, a, has some early opportunities for them, but there's no arguing with Drake May's talent. I, I, that's what I responded to uh, Todd from the Mount. Yeah, I get it. Carolina did not finish last year the way that that anybody would have wanted to. They had a lot of turnover on defense that actually might turn out to be a good thing for them. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Mm -hmm. Um, I could see them actually getting better. You know, of of course it's not the same recruiting star ratings, but I'm not sure that really matters in football to be perfectly honest with you. Um, So I like, I like Carolina's chances to outscore some teams. They did that a lot last year. I think they can do that again. 
with Drake May. And some of the re- receivers that they bought in in the transfer portal, I, I love Josh Downs. You know this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, they, they had a tendency last year to be Josh Downs heavy. And I do think they can diversify some of their offense next year. Which and he I think still found a way. That was the best part about it. Like, it's one oh, thing when you yeah, know yeah. who the go-to guy is. He still Josh. found ways to do it. Josh, Josh Downs was amazing. Um, I love yeah, I mean, Josh so- Downs because of the way that he reminded me of Torrey Holt. Everybody yeah. knew Torrey yeah. Holt was getting the football, and he still got it. Still made plays. Josh was like that. Uh, I, I'm eager to see him get his chance in the NFL. And the other thing, too, when it comes to North Carolina, is that Mac Brown's still likable, man. Mac, Mac Brown oh. can – can can the charm best. you and it's he's the best at that and that's they might take this give a, north care what's that he might take this as an insult but he is the king of the off season like he he, he really is. is he is he and really honestly is. there are but that matters in college football when it does seasons, recruiting whether it's at Texas stuff, or Carolina absolutely that absolutely matters and he is the best one of the best if not the best uh when it comes to that sort of thing all right from our friend Francis Ford Copulate. How did Marty Jordan Martinook go from waivers to this? Uh, is this wonderful resurgence all mental, emotional, state of mind, whatever it is? It is a great story. All right. Well, I think it's important to understand what ha- exactly happened with Jordan Martinook. Jordan Martinook was not put on waivers this year because of performance or because of the Canes didn't believe in him. Jordan Martinuk was put on waivers because he was a salary cap issue, right? So everybody, you, know, you can go back to any number of stories that were written at that time, whether it was Luke DeCock at the News and Observer or Corey Lavalette over at The Athletic and North State Journal, that it, it really, if I remember correctly, it came down to like him and Ethan Bear, right? And they had to make some like, who are you going to stash to try to make the salary cap thing work? And I, I think... um I think Gardner's contract, Jake Gardner, that Jake Gardner's long-term injury uh, also factored into all of this, right? So the particulars of it, I might be a little fuzzy on off the top of my head, but the point remains, it was a salary cap crunch issue. So the Canes took a risk. They're like, all right, we don't think that another team is going to bring on what he was owed this upcoming season or what he's due the following seasons. I don't know how the numbers off the top of my head, but it was Martin Nook occupied a really weird sweet spot that would have worked for the Canes, but not for another team. So they took the risk, went through waivers, obviously was there on opening night. And I, I don't think it's, we hear this all the time, Joe, from Rod Brindamore when it comes to guys like Jordan Stahl. There are guys on the ice that are doing the right thing every single time. It, it goes beyond a locker room presence and everything else, but they're doing all the things right. And it doesn't get noticed because it doesn't go on the score sheet. But every so often, you can have your moment in the sun. We saw this, what, two seasons ago with Jordan Stahl when he was on a point streak. And we saw this earlier in the postseason with Jordan Stahl. It just so happens that Martin Oak is having this breakout against a shaky New Jersey team. And, yeah, it is rewarding. It's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, hockey economics have changed. And it's unfortunate because a lot of the veteran players like a Martin Oak uh, don't have a chance to stick around the way that they used to. Uh, unless they're at this cut rate deal. And, you know, mm-hmm. you think of that 06 team, and, and obviously we all have our favorites from that team. But I always think about Kevin Adams from that team, yeah. a player like Kevin yeah. Adams. And unfortunately, in the NHL, they're running out of spots for players that were like Kevin Adams and Jordan Martin. That's all. It's just a reality. It's not like, oh, my God, the Canes hate Jordan Martin. Like, he's the no. most popular guy in their locker room. Like, come on. It just so happens that all those times he was yelling, Mr. Svetsnikov, he was actually zapping Svetch's power. And it's finally tapped into He it. has it now. He yeah. has he has it now. From Graham, uh, if the Canes do the thing, does that mean State UNC Duke fans can't talk badly about UVA 2019? <laughs> I feel like that's a shot at you, Joe. That's a shot at yeah, you. Yeah, I love it. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Uh, bracket luck is real. And, but as I learned... With, mm-hmm. with some of my crumpled up Alabama tickets from this year. Uh-huh. Even if bracket luck is real, you still have to take advantage and had tip to Tony Bennett. He took mm-hmm. advantage in 2019 of the situation. I do think the Canes still need to take advantage of this. Now, Edmonton winning last night was huge because in my opinion, Edmonton is the only team the Canes do not want to see that's still left on the board. That's the only team. Mm-hmm. Because quite frankly, Edmonton's going to run with them and their tippy top talent probably beats them. But Edmonton winning last night kind of keeps them in play out West. They're the only team out West. I think that can beat the Canes. I do not think the Panthers can beat the Canes uh, over a seven game series. Now I could be proven wrong about that 
of course it, it happens. I think those are coin toss situations. I'm not saying put the Canes in the finals. I'm just saying you don't go into that series thinking, well, man, we can't beat these guys. Oh my gosh. Right. How could we possibly ever get past these guys? So Yes, I, I, I would gladly tip my hat the same way I now have begrudgingly to Tony Bennett and Virginia for winning in 2019. Yes, I learned that lesson fair the enough. hard way. This year. Fair enough, fair enough. From Kinchin, uh, how soon is too soon to say your college football team won't win the conference based on the Vegas odds? Man, I haven't even looked at Vegas odds. I don't even know what. Like, I, I, I'm sure you've looked at Vegas odds. I have not. Sure. Yeah, it's never too soon. Uh, I. I this year, if we're talking about the ACC this year, I know Florida State and Clemson are obviously up there. Carolina. Mm. Uh, I don't know about team. Florida State, by the way. I think that's a, like Florida State's. Florida State's in that classic Miami boat where everybody's super, super hyped to see Florida State back. And I'm in very much like with Miami. Prove it before I start really buying yeah, into it. I, I didn't love the Micah Pittman transfer for Florida State. No. I thought he was a really good receiver for them last year. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't have other talented players. They obviously do. They have a difficult schedule. Clemson, obviously, still going to be really good on defense. Mm -hmm. Clay Klubnik is going to have, you know, we'll see what he can do in his second year in college football. If you made me pick somebody right now, I would pick Clemson. Um, some of those other scratchers we could talk about more as the as the summer goes along i have a feeling yeah. when you are on vacation there might be some gambling segments folks, that are folks, introduced middle Mahano of june Emilio. middle of june it's going to turn into a sports book and the worst boss nap it'll be fine uh um, you won't be from, here it's fine I will, it won't matter terminate from terminally confused hey joe armstrong or morris brennan armstrong or mj morris as your preferred qb1 at nc state and why um i don't know about preferred I would just say to you that Brennan Armstrong is here for a reason. Mm -hmm. He's an older player. I think you have to take advantage of that, both in college basketball and college football. He's a six-year player, and he's familiar with the offensive system that Robert and I has is putting in and is going to put in, and that the the, the, uh, the Wolfpack are going to run this season. The thing with Morris, talented, super talented. Uh, I want him. I want him to be healthy. I want him to understand what he's doing. It's mm -hmm. slight. It's a slight risk that he could leave if Armstrong is the starter this year, as as most normal people expect Armstrong to be the starter. I would yeah. love for this situation to work out that MJ Morris is able to redshirt, which he wasn't able to do last year as a true freshman. Mm -hmm. I would love for him to redshirt and then next year have a full grasp of everything that Anai wants to do, and then be the starter for the next three years. Remember now. MJ Morris enrolled last year, does not have a COVID year. So he yeah. like he now like our norm back on our normal schedule. We're back yeah. on it. It's like, like it's like yeah. my general feeling. I'm like, wow, man, the why do the why what are the playoffs seem like it's so early? Oh, that's right, because we stopped pushing everything back. Back on normal. So it's five years to play four. He played mm -hmm. in more than four games last year. Because remember, you can play in as many as four games and retain your year of eligibility. So Morris next year, you could see him actually even play in four games. But you know, still red shirt. So I yeah. would that would be the plan I would love to see for NC State. I'm sure that's probably what their hope is as well. All right. From Devo, what's the chances of another pro team like Major League Baseball coming to NC at some point in the next five to seven years? I feel like this question um is a question that we get asked so often. I think the reason why it's coming up is because what Pat Williams, uh, who's one of the co-founders of the Orlando Magic has put together a proposal to build a baseball stadium, a 45,000 seat baseball stadium in Orlando, as they put it, six miles from Disney, six miles from Universal. You got all the tourists that are coming in. It's it's basically like Vegas. Let's put something here when, when everybody is here in the summer. Um, it'd have to be a dome because there's no way, there's no way you're going to want to play baseball in Orlando in august okay like just july and august it's brutal so it's gonna have to be a dome i think the renderings made it look like it was a retractable roof i could be wrong but i have to go back and double check but all this is related to an ongoing situation with the tampa bay rays and the city of st pete um and they're in a constant state of back and forth about lease agreements and everything else um you know north carolina unfortunately joe we got population you know, a lot of, you know, it's one of the fastest growing areas in the country. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. 
But unfortunately, there's just not the infrastructure right now to make that happen in the next five to seven years, uh, even if the corporate support might show up in the next five to seven years. Infrastructure has to be the biggest thing, and it's just not there right now. Yeah, I would say if Apple and Amazon get here in a foothold in the triangle in a way that is gangbusters, yep. that certainly improves the odds. You got to remember with baseball, too, that's a long effing season. That mm -hmm. is a serious commitment. I will say what baseball has done this year to speed up games ha will help them tremendously. Uh, but if you would have asked me this like two years ago, I would have said, I do not like the direction that baseball is going. You mm -hmm. know what I would love to see too uh, with baseball, which I, you know, like we're not allowed to talk about in the, in the real world. Uh, can we advocate for baseball to embrace um, their Latino and Hispanic population uh, in, in North Carolina. I would love to see this area embrace yeah. its Latino and Hispanic population because as we saw in the World Baseball Classic, that Miami stadium, which has never been filled before, no. was filled. And take a look around. They didn't look like me. They look like you and your dad. So baseball, baseball, the game is not the problem. It's how baseball is discussed, presented uh, for a particular demographic that is, I, I guess I have no problem saying it, literally dying off. So the World Baseball Classic did show you that the game itself, not the problem. Have some fun with it and then you'll be you, you'll get people that uh, that will pack it out. All right. From uh, Coach Tim Buckley. Would you have a better chance at hitting a 94 mile an hour fastball or making a save on Wayne Grip? I mean, Jordan Martin Nook. Um, well, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because uh, shout out to Tim Healy. He's the uh, NC State Ice Pack coach. He reached out to me. I, I, Tim, if you're listening or watching this on YouTube, I got your message. I appreciate it. I owe you a call back. But he did offers like, hey, if you guys want to go like full Marty McGee and get in the full goalie suit, we'll get you out there. I think I would have an easier time trying to hit a 94, making contact on a 94 mile an hour bass, uh, 94 mile an hour fastball, than stopping like a vulcanized rubber puck coming my way. I think I that's have a chance. I think, I, neither. None. You couldn't. You couldn't make Can't contact. Either. You couldn't make contact. Uh, not at, not at this point in my life. Not at 40 okay. after two back surgeries. <laughs> yeah, the minute you make contact, your back goes out. That would be. Uh, I got nothing. That would that would be bad. I got that nothing, and, and I, I was on skates recently. And I always used to say, people would say, goalies are the best skater on a team, and I'd be like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And then I now realized, you know. being able to stand there and keep your balance uh -huh. and move in an uh -huh. instant, the way that they do, is really really hard. <laughs> not easy. Really really not hard. Easy. All right, from Kelly, what's your Canes playoff tailgate must have? Beer. It's always beer. Right. Um, I, I, well, they're not a sponsor. I love subs. I love to have oh, yeah. a sub at Makes sense. a tailgate and I do like beer. Duh. Um, we, uh, or do you have the, the gotta bourbon be high question? Life. Do you have the we bourbon gotta, question? High life. Shout out to Serena because she has the high life. I might actually, if they wrap it up tonight, I might actually be hitting the champagne of beers oh, tonight. Perfect. And then, yeah, we got Bane. Hey, Joe, can we get Julio to do a live tasting of bourbon on Thursdays to set up a great weekend for him? First recommendation is the old granddad bonded, 20 bucks, but a great taste. And yeah, that's kind of the point. You can find really good bourbon um, on the cheap. It doesn't have to be super expensive bourbon all the time. Uh, but yeah, we're, 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 getting, we're getting Joe down the bourbon um, life. I'm, I'm excited about this. Maybe I can be a guest on 919 Vice. That's right. New 919 Vice podcast will be out with a with Raleigh Brewing as our first guest. That'll be out on Friday. I think I've got Wayne on the hook to do a shot of the week on our YouTube shorts. Maybe we can bring Sorry. you out. We can bring you out to graffiti so you can get a one out shot and uh, just kind of go about your day. How do you feel about that, Joe? I could do the shot of Joe after I do the shot of the week. See, there it is. <laughs> Everything's coming together. Absolutely love it. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of Ovius and Gilio. Shout out to everybody who has thrown us five stars. We appreciate that. Shout out to everybody who has uh, subscribed to the YouTube page. Don't forget to leave comments, uh, hit the likes, you know, all the ways in which you can manipulate the algorithm in our favor. Also, shout out to Mike Soto. He requests an outro. 
He requests an outro for the podcast. So I hit up Rand and I said, hey, man, you got the intro. Now I need an outro to send things out. So we'll, we'll be working on that little by little, just you know, these little building blocks uh, that we'll keep, uh, we'll keep working on. Enjoy your weekend. We'll talk about the Carolina Hurricanes. Obviously, we'll get a better idea of what the Panthers uh, schedule is going to look like on Monday. And who knows what else might happen over the weekend. We'll see you then.